All right, we're going to look at ions and ion formations. Uh, so we're going to talk about exactly what is a bond, and then we're going to talk about, in particular, um, ionic bonds and ions. And that's this whole chapter. Okay, so what is a bond? Well, a bond is a force that holds two atoms together. So it's what makes up table salt to hold the Na with the chlorine. It's what makes up methane, okay, to hold carbon to the hydrogen. So it's whatever's up holding those two atoms together, all right? Um, when we talk about a bond, the only thing that's involved in a bond are the valence electrons. So we're talking about our valence electrons that are involved in the bonding, okay? And these are our outermost energy levels. Remember that the valence electrons are electrons that are on the outside. So we don't really care about the core electrons because they're on the inside and they're not doing anything to be involved with another atom, just the valence ones, okay? So now we're going to talk about the... I have two here. It should actually be three. There are, are really three types of bond attractions, two of them that are really close together, all right? But the one... Um, so the first one is the attraction between a nu positive nucleus, because nucleuses have protons. So the positive nucleus of one atom, and then the negative electron of another. I'm going to call that a covalent bond, and that's our entire next chapter. Okay, so a positive nucleus of one negative electron of another, that's a covalent bond. I'm talking about two uh, particles that are attracted to one another. Okay, and all bond attractions have to be opposites. You can't have like charges attracting. Okay, the one that we're going to focus on this chapter is the second one there. That's the attraction between a positive and negative ion, and that's ionic. Okay, so I can have two ions of opposite attraction to make a bond. I can have a positive nucleus of one, negative an electron of another attraction to make a bond. The last one is very similar to the first one. Um, it's the attraction of a positive nucleus or a cation, okay, and a sea of electrons or a bunch of electrons that are shared throughout it. And that's a metallic bond, and that'll be part of our chapter 9. So those are our three basic types of bond attractions that we're going to deal with, okay? We're going to kind of segue now and talk about electron dot structures that you should have had your freshman year, all right? Because all we really care about here in electron dot structures are and bonding is the number of valence electrons because they're the outermost electrons, okay? So dot diagrams only show the valence electrons, all right? Remember that those are the electrons that are after the noble gas in an electron configuration, they are the S and P electrons. So we're not really dealing with the D electrons because D, the D block and D electrons sometimes count and sometimes don't. Um, D block electrons, we'll talk about here in a second, are a little bit more confusing. All right, but pretty much what we, what we deal with is that the S and P electrons total are what we have for a valence electron. They're what's on the outside of a core. All right. Um, so for example, carbon. Carbon is in group 14. Carbon has four valence electrons. If you would write out the configuration for carbon, okay, um, it would be S2 and then P2. Okay, so you'd have four there valence electrons that you would put on the outside. Um, if we look at, say, magnesium, magnesium would have two valence electrons. It is in group two. Okay, if you look, though, at fluorine, okay, fluorine would have an S2 and then a P5. That's seven valence electrons. So fluorine would have seven valence electrons. And what group is it in? It's in 17. So you kind of just drop the one to figure out exactly how many valence electrons something has if it's, you know, in the 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 kind of row. Now, um, so if we look over here at my chart, which is a little bit different than yours, okay, see how it has all the A's there for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8. Um, the way your, your chart normally is done is 1 through 18. And we're kind of skipping here in the middle. That would be the whole D block. It would be like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, if you have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, that's more of the group numbers you would see for us. But group 18 is really kind of talking about like 8 or 8A, which is representative. There are 8 valence electrons there. Okay, and like I said, a D block can have a different number that they can lose of electrons. So a different number of electrons that they can lose. Um... So it's usually one or two, but not always. You have vanadium that can lose four, five, or six. You have copper that tends to lose two or three. You've got iron that tends to lose two or three. So it makes a big difference um, because it's not always the same, and we'll look more at that when we name and write formulas um, a little later on in the chapter. Okay. When we go to write, no, write, writing dot diagrams. So this is kind of this part. This is the next part. All right. So it kind of actually should be kind of separate. Um, you have one dot on each side before you have two when we write these dot diagrams. And again, we're only doing dots 
to represent um, a valence electron. So all I care about is the valence electrons. Okay, um, the electrons need to spread out, and remember that it's only a model. All right, so we have to have one dot on each side represent one valence electron for each one. So we're not doing every single electron, just the valence electron. So if we look at this chart over here, okay, see how lithium has one dot next to it's in group one. Beryllium has two dots, and so on. They're on opposite sides of one another. Boron has three. They're all spread out. Carbon has four. They're all spread out. Okay, so notice how they don't start to overlap to have two on a side of an element until you really have to, because again, they're representing an electron, and electrons like to spread out from one another. So these are very simple electron dot diagrams or Lewis dot diagrams. Okay, and they're going to segue us into the next chapter when we talk about Lewis structures, but for right now, um, you're dealing with kind of the dots. Okay, and each dot again is an electron. So if we look at over here, we see neon. Neon has eight electrons. Notice so there's two on every side, and every side is now what we call full. We're part of a full energy level. Okay, so that leads us into the next rule. It's called an octet rule. Okay, so we're going to use these electron dot structures in this octet rule here in a second to actually form an ionic bond. So we talk about the octet rule. Okay, octet rules deal with noble gases that are stable with eight electrons. Why? Because they have a full energy level. Okay. Um, and again, these compounds are then going to form so that they either have eight electrons around them. Okay, these atoms are either going to lose, share, or gain electrons. That's an atom's goal, is to lose, share, or gain an electron to have its stable configuration around it so that it is then happy and usually then a lower energy as well. All right, if we look above, actually back up here for a second, notice how if they're in the same group, all right, they're in the same group, but they have the same number of valence electrons. And then they have the same number of dots. So all of these ones here are in the same group. They all have one dot. They're in um, group one. Okay, these ones are in group 16. They all have six dots around them. Okay, so same groups have same number of valence electrons, which later on we'll talk about, which is kind of why a lot of those elements have the same types of properties. All right, so now we're going to draw some electron dot notations for a couple elements, which you actually have the answers up above, but try and do it without looking at it. All right, so let's see potassium. Okay, potassium is letter K. First thing you got to remember is the symbol. Okay, now we got to find potassium. All right, well, where is potassium located on the periodic table? Okay, well, potassium is in group one, all right, which means that it's going to have a one dot next to it. Now, does it matter which side you put that one dot on? No, just put it somewhere next to it. Okay, phosphorus is P. All right, phosphorus is all the way over there on the right. He's in group 15, which means that he has five valence electrons. So I got to go one, two, three, four, five. Now, does it really matter whether the top one is the one that has two or the left that has two or the right that has two? No, it doesn't make any difference. But it could not look like that. That would be wrong. All right, don't do that. Okay, bromine. Bromine is in, is in group 17, so that means he has seven valence electrons. So let's put seven around. So one, two, four, five, six, seven. And now I gotta have dot diagram for bromine. The last one is aluminum. Aluminum has three valence electrons because it is in group 13, which means that it has three valence electrons. One, two, three. I usually start at the top and go to the right, but it really doesn't matter. Okay, so let's take these dot structures now. Remember, we're going to talk about how you form an ionic bond. Okay, remember that ionic bond are two oppositely charged ions. Okay, we talked about this last chapter a little bit where we dealt with metals. Metals tend to lose electrons and form cations. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons and form anions. Okay, um, so one's got to gain and one's got to lose. You can't have both gaining, you can't have both losing. The other thing to keep in mind here is this part down here, okay, is that a sodium atom and a sodium ion are two totally different things. So I'm going to keep in mind here, we look at this next example, okay, a sodium atom is an Na, a sodium ion will have a charge. They are two separate things, okay. Sodium is really reactive in water, just Na. You put it in water and it flames and it's, you know, makes this big reaction, it sizzles. Na plus in water is what salt is when it dissolves in water. Okay, so two totally different things. So keep that in mind when we're forming a bond over here. Okay, so how we form a bond, so we're going to form salt. Okay, so Na, this is Na's electron configuration. 
it has one valence electron, this is in group one, okay? We have, we're going to add that to chlorine. Here's chlorine's electron configuration, okay? Notice how he has one open spot here. So what happens is this electron from sodium moves, okay, and gets lost and goes over to chlorine. Because if sodium loses this, this electron, now it's got a stable electron configuration where it's all done and there's no more extras, okay, because I'm at the end of an energy level here with energy level two. All right, so what happens is then sodium becomes a positive, Na+, plus because it lost an electron. Chlorine gains that extra electron to have its full octet now to be all the way done with the P level, okay, and all the other three level, and it becomes a negative. So one became a positive, one became a negative. The way that we normally draw these is not like this because that's a lot more work. We tend to draw them like this, all right? Okay, the Na has the one dot or one electron, and gets lost to chlorine. So what's nice about these is we kind of ignore the rest of the core electrons because we don't want to care about them anyway. All right. Um, so we see something where you'll have like that. All right. Oftentimes I just make you draw just this. That's good enough. Okay. Notice how there is a plus energy there. That means that you um, get energy out when this happens. I will talk more about this in the next thing. Is that bond? Things that are bonded are way lower in energy than things that aren't. So when they bond together, you lose a whole bunch of energy, which makes them very exothermic. Okay, so we're almost done. All right, um, you have binary compounds that we're going to look at to start because they're the easiest. They contain only two different atoms. You can have Na and Cl. I can have Mg and O. I can have Ba and Cl2. All that means is that I had two chlorines for that barium. It's still a binary because there's still just two different types of atoms. Maybe I should put types in there. Okay. So just two different types. doesn't matter if you have three of one and eight of the other or whatever, um, but they have to be two different types. Okay, it's binary. All right, so now I'm going to look at the charge of an ion and then look at how we form an ionic bond then for an example. And we're going to have a couple examples for you. So let's look at calcium. Okay, calcium's in group two, which means it has two valence electrons. Fluorine, fluorine's in group 17, which means it has seven valence electrons. Okay, so what's going to happen here is that calcium is going to lose one electron to the fluorine, and now this fluorine is stable and good. But calcium still isn't. Calcium still has one extra valence electron floating around. So what do you got to do? You have to actually find another fluorine atom, because nothing says you can't. So calcium goes out and he finds another fluorine atom, loses his other electron to this other fluorine atom, and now we're, we're good. Okay, so there's actually kind of two ionic bonds here to make this stable, to make a stable compound. I have one calcium and two fluorines. So you think of it kind of like I have one calcium and two fluorines. They're kind of, they're, those lines are kind of our bonds that are holding them together, all right? We don't normally draw ionic bonds like that, but that's kind of how you can think of it as well, okay? So I'm ending up now, I had two electrons that were lost, two electrons that were gained, all right? Which means I end up with a formula that's called CAF2 because I needed two fluorines to balance out my one calcium. Okay, so go ahead and try those next three examples and then check your answers when you get done. All right, so those should be your answers there. Okay, I have the formula and I have how the ionic bonds are formed. Um, Something to remember here is how you tell which one is the metal and the non-metal. Remember, metals are on the left side of the table, and they're always the ones that lose. Non-metals are on the right side of the table, and they're always the ones that gain. Plus, the metals should always have less valence electrons. The non-metals should always have more, which is why metals lose and non-metals gain. All right. Um, hydrogen is included in the ones that tend to lose. Um, if he's with an, another non-metal, he'll lose an electron. Technically, they actually just share, which is part of the next chapter we'll look at later. So you kind of ignore hydrogen for right now.